Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 11th edition of UCD Alumni Relations webinar series, UCD in Conversation. My name is Camille Rogers, and I am the Alumni Relations Officer for the UCD College of Arts and Humanities. We're delighted to welcome our UCD alumni community from around the world to hear stories and ideas from fellow alumni, UCD academics, and friends at UCD. For those of you tuning in for the first time, this series reflects UCD's new strategy entitled Rising to the Future and its four strategic themes which focus on UCD's contribution to global challenges. These are creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. This evening's session is in collaboration with our friends at Mali, the Museum of Literature Ireland. A major partnership between UCD and the National Library of Ireland, Mali draws inspiration from the genius and influence of UCD's most famous student, James Joyce, and is named after his best known female character, Molly Bloom. The format for this evening includes a 30 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session. We'll wrap up around 7.45 or 8 p.m. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will help us to connect and make this format more personal, so please do submit them. We will get to as many as we can at the end of the conversation, but please note that we might not have time to address every question. Um, if for whatever reason you have to leave the conversation early or have a problem with connectivity, don't worry. We're recording this session and it will be available on the UCD Alumni YouTube channel very soon. So now I'll hand it over to Dr. Lucy Collins, Associate Professor in the UCD School of English Drama and Film, who will moderate a conversation with Simon O'Connor, Director at Molly. They have very kindly joined us today for a discussion entitled, Molly, a Museum of the Past, a Laboratory for the Future. So without any further ado, uh, over to you, Lucy. Thanks, Camille. Um, I'm really delighted to get a chance tonight to chat to Simon and to tease out some of his experiences at Mali, which many of you, I'm sure, will have experienced yourselves um, and I will have been looking forward to getting back to after lockdown. So Simon O'Connor, as you know, is the director of the Museum of Literature Ireland, which is a collaboration between UCD and the National Library of Ireland. Um, the museum is housed in the original home of UCD, so in Newman House, obviously made very famous by Joyce. Um, and it's a really spectacular group of buildings uh, in the very centre of Dublin on St Stephen's Green, so a, a beautiful and brilliant location for cultural events. Simon is a composer by training and uh, he was founding curator of the Little Museum of Dublin, just across the green, in fact, um, which uh, is a really um, innovative uh, and ambitious museum. It's, he started it from scratch in 2011 and went on then, of course, to uh, manage its highly ambitious programs of exhibitions and educational events. Under his tenure, the museum won numerous awards, including the European Commission's Europa Nostra Award for Cultural Heritage. And it was also long listed for a number of awards, such as the Euro European Museum of the Year. Simon has worked across the arts and creative sector and continues to be active as a composer. So um, I'm, as Camille said, my name is Lucy Collins and I work in the School of English Drama and Film, which is obviously very close associations to Molly. And my main field is on, um, I teach and, and research on modern poetry, mainly Irish poetry and especially poetry by women. So I'm very interested and in, we'll discuss perhaps later some of the, the, the way in which uh, women writers have featured in the museum. And um, I'm also involved in a number of projects with UCD Special Collections, um, including the Irish Poetry Reading Archive. So um, obviously there's loads that we could be talking about tonight, but I wanted to really think about three main areas uh, um, as we bring up the discussion. And the first is the relationship between past and future, you know, that was signalled by the title of this talk. Um, and that is the great combination that Molly has between these beautiful historic buildings and um, this uh, emphasis on innovative, uh, creative responses and engaging with the, the, the larger literary community and you know, contemporary writers. Um, the second thing I'd like to, to uh, pick Simon's brains on is the digital element. I mean, obviously we're very familiar with the fact that since lockdown, we've been relying on digital media for our entertainment and our participation. Um, but obviously Molly has been using um, digital material in its exhibitions in really innovative ways and obviously has a, a you know more forward-looking and far-reaching program so I'd like to um, talk a bit about that and then the third thing which is very relevant to UCD of course is the idea of the museum as a collaboration between 
the museum space, the library collections, and then an educational institution. So, you know, that interface with students and so on, which is obviously a big interest for me as a teacher. So um, I'd like to start then, begin at the beginning in a way, or, or maybe even before the beginning, and ask Simon to tell us how he moved into his career as a museum director, you know, having come from this musical background. You know, when were you bitten by the curation bug? Um, thanks, Lucy, and uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, that's, uh, I mean, I, I kind of came into, I came into museum curation uh, really, I mean, not necessarily by accident. I'd been working in publishing for a very long time um, and then involved in the arts through my, in my capacity as a composer. And, um, and actually it was, it, was, uh, it was at the, well, a couple of years into the last recession and um, a colleague of mine, Trevor White, who I'd been working with in publishing, um, met me for lunch one day and he said, I, I have this great idea. We're going to set up a museum and um, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, it's going to be a museum of Dublin because Dublin needs one. And uh, you'll, I'll be the director and you'll be the, you'll be the curator. And, um, and I just thought he was completely nuts, to be honest. And, uh, and, but we managed to, it was a really interesting uh, moment in time. We managed to get a building from Dublin City Council on St. Stephen's Green, which was um, unused. There was a lot of unused, um, I suppose, city has property uh, at the time. And, uh, and they saw the potential in the idea, and Fulcher Ireland saw the potential in the idea. And what was interesting to me was, was that I hadn't really considered the museum space as somewhere that my kind of, you know, what is, like, to be completely frank, a kind of a, a, a raggle taggle bag of, of skills, um, that it was a space that they could really coalesce and, and, and come together. So um, it was a place where you could be really, you could be really creative. Um, my experience in marketing and in particularly in design and publishing, um, it was a place where you had to communicate to like very, very different audiences all the time. Um, and, uh, and we saw it as, I mean, we saw the little museum as this kind of uh, really fun, experimental, uh, three-dimensional magazine article about Dublin history. Uh, that's, I mean, and we talked about it in those terms. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily use mu museum language all the time. We, we, we used a lot of publishing language. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, we talked about entry points for visitors and, and how to keep visitors on the page when they were in the museum. Um, but it was, it was an interesting project in that it kind of, uh, it brought us into that, into that whole world uh, and it brought me into that whole world and uh, uh, gradually, hopefully, professionalised me a little bit in relation to museums. By accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was just thinking there, you're obviously someone who likes to start things from scratch, you know, or is willing to kind of step in at that very early stage. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, for many people, I think it will be really daunting to, in the case of Molly, you know, to be taking up this role, uh, you know, a very ambitious role, before the entity fully existed, you know? So I was wondering, could you um, talk a bit about um, the very origins of the idea of Molly, which, you know, I think pre predated your arrival, mm. um, and also the, the challenges, and I suppose the opportunities of getting that, that space from the start to work with? Yeah, I mean, the, the project predates me by, um, uh, by, by, by quite a number of years, actually. Um, I think there had been a growing uh, desire in UCD for quite some time to turn um, the houses here uh, on Stevens Green to maybe a more public use. So they're, you know, these are obviously the trophy buildings uh, of the university. They're the original site of the university. Um, they're kind of living, breathing historical artifacts themselves, particularly in relation to literature. Um, and, uh, and they had been, and they had been used for, you know, for amazing events and exhibitions and launches. Um, conferrals, you know, lots of people have these strong emotional connections to the buildings um, as a result of that. But I think to do something that was uh, that would bring the wider public uh, in, uh, I think was 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 on the cards. Um, and then uh, it was really under the stewardship of um, my now chairman, who uh, was then um, vice president for capital projects in UCD, Eamon Kant, uh, who's also a sculptor as well, a uh, very fine sculptor, Eamon. Um, really marshaled the project through um, and uh, brought in um, uh, early on in the project um, Martin and Carmel Nocton uh, and the Nocton Foundation um, gave a major donation to the project of five million euro which is really an incredible amount in the context of philanthropic support of culture in this state. Um, 
and that I think uh, exploded the ambition um, of, of what was going on. Um, in turn, Fulcher Ireland came in, um, the state uh, tourist development agency with two and a half million euro. Um, and then UCD Foundation fundraised the rest um, through, through, through private donations. So the, the project total cost was kind of in and around 10 and a half million um, in total. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was carried through under budget by UCD Estates. Um, I mean, it was like people would have laughed at me at the time when I talked about it, but I mean, I felt it was a very luxurious uh, startup situation to be in because, you know, I was surrounded just by so many experts, both from UCD, from the National Library, um, and all of this goodwill kind of egging this thing over the line uh, in, you know, what I feel was a really spectacular way in the end. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in you talking there about that range of expertise, because this is the, the beauty of the collaboration, I suppose, is that you're pull mm. pulling in all those different elements from, from libraries, from UCD, etc. Now, obviously, you talked about the importance of patrons uh, and donors to, you know, that, that important financial commitment and that vision, I suppose, to put their, their money into these projects. But I'm wondering, is there anything else um, that you're, you're actually, is made possible or ideas perhaps that you gain from, from those patrons or from those donors, you know, do those, aside from giving them money, do they also kind of bring ideas or the, of their own vision to the project at all? Oh, completely. I mean, by the, by the time I was uh, installed as, as director, the, the curation of, of the permanent exhibits um, was really, really far down the line. And that was driven um, primarily by, um, by Professor Margaret Kelleher from UCD mm -hmm. um, and Catherine McSherry, who, McSherry, who's the Deputy Director of the National Library of Ireland. So um, again, I was, I was kind of walking into uh, a sensibility that already existed around, around and an ambition for the exhibitions themselves. Um, uh, and, you know, that was something that was already thinking in really, really interesting ways um, about what a project like this would be, what, what, what kind of a, um, a cultural space this would be, what kind of a museum it would be. Um, I mean, when you're setting up a museum uh, or any, any business, actually, and, and any of our uh, alumni here who are, who are business people could tell you this at the very beginning. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, mon you know, there's a lot of mundane uh, details, you know, there's a lot of technical stuff going on um, that you have to set up. But the joy is that, is that it's, a it's a tabula rasa as well, you know, organizationally, that you're setting up this thing from scratch. So you can really think about, and this is important for cultural institutions, not just what's going to be on display, um, but the very nature of the organization and the kind of ability you can install into it uh, for it to develop in interesting ways long after you're gone yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really struck. I was lucky enough to be able to access the building just before it closed, you know, for the, the whole kind of rebuild and, and renovation. Um, and there were parts of it, I mean, there were parts of the building I knew quite well, but there were other parts, you know, that were obviously kind of hidden away, you know, that, that I'd never seen before, um, in a terrible state, some of them. Um, and, you know, so that sense when, you know, you go back to the launch, you know, and the sense of transformation and vision, like, is really striking, I think, when you, you see it before and, and after. And I think, you know, anybody visiting Molly would have that strong sense. There's something about the building that really, you know, communicates its history, I think, in a really, a really positive and, and, and kind of memorable way. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about, I mean, obviously there's the infrastructural dimension, how the building was in some ways kind of remade in some parts uh, and new parts kind of added and the development of the garden, obviously, which was beautiful. Um, but then there's uh, the actual exhibition, you know, the actual, the, those, you know, the curatorial um, uh, structures, if you like. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the relationship between those two parts, you know, the building and mm. innards, as it were. Yeah. So um, the, the architects uh, who, who were brought on board to, um, to work on the, on, on, I suppose, the redesign and the, um, and the, and the, the kind of ad adaptation of the, of the site, Scott Talon Walker, um, really, Scott Talon Walker's principal um, principal task was to make the to make the site universally accessible, uh, first and foremost, um, and then to open it up in a way. I mean, you know, any anyone who's on this on on this uh, webinar will know um, who's been in these who was in these buildings in the past will know that it was. I mean, it was a maze of little corridors and hidden staircases that seem to kind of go on for infinity and all. And I mean, unbelievably charming and um, but but 
Scots did a really, really clever thing. They kind of, where they were, on it, where they were able to create interventions, um, a lot of it was focused on opening up the spaces to make them, um, I suppose, to make them feel airier, to increase visibility out into the back gardens as you move through the site. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the centerpiece of it was taking um, the Alamax, which was the old exam hall that people would remember from, you know, dram sock and uh, dances and, and things like that, and to create a mezzanine level within it. And that gave the requisite um, exhibition floor space um, to do something that was that was um, considerable, something that was major, that would be considered, you know, uh, an attraction that people could come and see to, uh, come to uh, and visit. Um, so that was, um, that was Scott's side of it. And then Ralph Applebaum uh, Associates, um, their London office, they're a fantastic international exhibition design company, and their London office came in to uh, design the frameworks very much in harmony with uh, Scott's architectural uh, design and um, there was a great conservation architect uh, uh, architects on the project as well, Carrig, um, and I think everybody just sang together with all of this respect for the historical fabric, um, but also uh, this idea that everyone was making something really, really new and really contemporary together, um, and uh, you know, and the finish. Uh, the type of things that I would kind of look for in museums, you know, but like, I mean, the finish of the exhibition work was just really, really um, top class, you know, um, the level of detail that everybody was going into, um, as well as on the curatorial side, was just really exceptional. Yeah, I think you get a real sense, I mean, that, that um, mezzanine effect in, in the Isle of Max is fabulous in terms of like, if you feel like you're sort of floating in the space, mm. you know, it's that great sense of preserving the, the feel in some ways of the original space, but just giving it a whole different way of, you know, I suppose, interacting with it in, in that sense. And um, mm. obviously, Joyce is you know, key to this whole thing, you know, the, the Joyce in Association is really, really important, obviously, in terms of the visibility, you know, uh, worldwide of the museum, you know, very much linked to, to Joyce. Um, and I was wondering, um, obviously, there are key elements um, in the building that are, uh, in particular, that are linked to the National Library collections, the Joyce manuscripts, and, and of course, the, the edition of Ulysses, which has this really iconic space. Mm. Um, and, you know, there is also a sense in which um, a number of the exhibitions are kind of speaking back to Joyce in some way or engaging mm -hmm. with Joyce's work. Um, I mean, obviously, Alan Gilson's film being, you know, a key one. But I, I was just wondering if you felt that um, that a lot of the your vision of the museum was kind of building on that Joyce, um, our understanding of Joyce or the versatility of Joyce or, um, you know, do you see in, in a sense Joyce's work as almost like a template for the whole, the whole thing, you know, the whole project in some way? Yeah, it's really, it's a really, it's a really, really interesting question. I mean, from the outset, um, the goal of the project, a, a, a kind of a core goal of the project was to celebrate Joyce. Um, and to engage visitors with with his work, uh, specifically as a writer. Um, uh, I think that's what, what made the partnership with the National Library so special, that it, it then as well created an opportunity for the library to put on display um, their greatest Joyce treasures. And these are, I mean, these are, you know, what we say in the museum world, they're visitable objects, you know, like they're pilgrimage objects. People will come to see copy number one, and um, they'll come to see those notebooks. Um, but I think what's, what's interesting, um, as a museum to, to, for us to develop out of that is that Joyce is, you know, I mean, Joyce is a great enabler um, and we continuously look to Joyce all the time. We, we kind of describe him as the beating heart of the museum um, and, and he's throughout this place in, in often very invisible ways as well. Um, our learning programme, for example, is all, you know, for very young children, is all coming out of ideas um, that are, you know, that are that are coming from Joyce. Um, they're all named after kind of little components within Ulysses. Um, and we're trying to bring kids into that. You know, I mean, we have, we, you know, one of the most popular parts of these programs are like young kids making portmanteaus, sitting watching a film of Finnegan's Wake. I mean, you know, <laughs> and the six, and you know, the seven and eight year olds love it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's the challenge as well at the museum is to kind of mm -hmm. say, you know, these are, these are not only um, our really great writers, um, but also, it is our job to engage the public with them and to make their work um, as accessible as possible to the public and not just a public who already likes them, um, but a public who has never heard of them or even feels that um, they're maybe not permitted uh, to like them. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, I was really struck, obviously, the River Run exhibition, which is like really beautiful, that this combination of the visual movement of, of language, but the fact that, you know, in an, in an audio sense, it incorporates all these different, you know, poetry, folklore, you know, all these different kinds of language, as well as mm. you know, what we might see as literature in the, in the uh, established sense. And the, the Alan Gilson and film, like it really struck me that it is almost like a microcosm of the whole building in terms of the way it combines you know, lang language represented visually with kind of historical material and so on, which in a way the building and the, all the exhibition spaces are doing it in their different ways. Um, I know that from some things you've said when you've been introducing events and so on in, in Mali, that you are really committed to um, engaging with or kind of perhaps retrieving or highlighting neglected writers. I mean, on the one hand, you have mm. Joyce as, you know, the iconic figure, but you've also featured some, you know, less known or perhaps less appreciated uh, writers, particularly women, obviously. You had the Kate mm. O'Brien um, exhibition first and then the uh, Eva Gore Booth features. And, then, and now we'll, we'll talk, be talking in a minute about Nulo Fuelon. Um, mm. And so I was wondering, first of all, um, is this a you know is this something that you are you know committed to in an ongoing way to have this combination of sort of the canonical writer and the, the you know the, the less well known, and does that link to um, the larger vision of kind of opening literature to the world you know and making everyone as you just said there everyone to be comfortable in the space you know from small kids to maybe people who aren't used to going to museums you know do you see those elements as connected? Yeah, completely. Um, I mean, in a way, for 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 better or worse, I suppose we've had a we've had an approach um, to celebrating uh, the kind of canon of Irish writing in this country, um, often in quite a limited way. Certainly internationally, the way we project, and um, and that's been addressed both academically and publicly, uh, you know, over recent decades. And we felt that certainly with them, um, you know, if you open a museum of literature in the 21st century and um, that you should be wading right in there um, and making bold statements about that and, 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 and saying you know look this this literary history that we have is actually far richer um, than five or six uh, writers you know it's far more diverse um, it's far more interesting uh, and although they are incredible writers and um, let's start getting let's start digging around in everybody else and um, so I mean in a way you know, and uh, this is kind of a bit of, uh, I suppose, the mischievousness in, in myself is, you know, I felt that we really needed to have a bit of a shot across the bows um, from the minute we opened. Um, and choosing Kate O'Brien as the first temporary exhibition, um, Kate was a student in Newman House as well. So there are all these other links um, in. Uh, and uh, and I felt that was just really important. You know, there was a lot of academic work going on around Kate O'Brien, you know, kind of leading up to that point as well. Um, so there was interest in her. Um, I'd always wanted to 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 have a look at Nula Ofuelo in some way. Um, uh, and we'll be talking about that exhibition a little later. Uh, we're following that exhibition with uh, a temporary exhibition that's aimed at, you know, two and three-year-olds. Um, so we'll be going from this kind of really arch adult subject um, to, uh, you know, exhibition components that would literally be, you know, installed a couple of feet off the floor because some of the visitors won't be able to walk yet. Um, but I think, but I think that's that's a big part of our role uh, with this museum is to is to um, kind of take some of the the excess reverence out mm -hmm. of the subject uh, and to say, look, you know, this um, this is an art form that is um, that everybody can appreciate and that everybody can enjoy, uh, and really to just encourage an interest in it. Mm. Yeah. Now, could you tell a bit more? You, we talked the other day about some of your some of the educational projects you're involved in, and particularly that commitment to the younger age, mm. you know, primary school age and so on. And often that's a thing which is not very visible. You know, if you're just walking into the museum as a visitor, you don't you're not so aware of how much time and work and planning goes into those other projects, mm. you know, particularly the educational ones. So I was wondering, could you t t talk a little bit more about that, about what you're involved in there? Yeah, so I mean, we felt from very early on that um, that the museum should open with a with an education program that focused actually on on the young the youngest audiences to begin with, um, and then in particular actually audiences that we felt might not necessarily easily get to visit um, this museum uh, uh, or necessarily engage with this subject. So. Um, the logic behind that is also as well as is around audience development. I mean, we're we're a new museum, and if we want to 
insert ourselves into the cultural landscape quickly uh, in, in this country. And um, the quickest way to do it is actually through the youngest audiences, because, you know, within 10 years time, all of those kids who are coming through that learning program are going to be coming here to, you know, they'll be applying for jobs here. They'll be going to study in UCD, you know, and um, they'll be our adult audience. Um, and it happens quickly. So, uh, so I think focusing on, on, on younger children um, uh, is, was, was a, a priority for us. Um, and then also looking at teenage, uh, teenagers as well and creating um, online uh, teaching components for teenagers. And we have a very interesting bursary that we launched this year uh, called the Edna O'Brien Bursary, um, which is a donor-led project. It's in perpetuity and it's a kind of an immersive one week long bursary for 15 students with a, with a living writer. And it's kind of an amazing program. Um, and again, this, as you said, this isn't publicly visible, um, but this is, you know, this is some of the real work uh, of the museum. I mean, we, you know, a function of the lockdown actually was us talking a lot about digital inequality. So, you know, lots of us pivoted over, um, probably no, no one more so than yourself, Lucy, and, and, and the academics in Belfield, but pivoting over to running things on Zoom and online. And we brought a lot of our, t our, our learning programs online, but we also realized that a, a huge amount of the younger children that we were working with who maybe had access issues or were more difficult to get to um, online, just closed them out entirely. So we were back to making packs that we could send off to the, the youth and community groups that we work with, like the YMCA and Solus and the Irish Refugee Council and getting our kind of learning packs physical again and out to those places. Um, but, uh, but, but I think it is, I mean, it, you know, the museum has to be useful to the community as well. It's, it's, it's more than just a place to visit. And I like that idea that you can use the kind of the, the latest digital technology for this, for the outreach, but you also sometimes need to be flexible enough to go back mm -hmm. to, you know, the more yeah. kind of traditional modes as well that yeah. people are comfortable with and can access. Yeah. In terms of the third level angle, I mean, obviously, um, you know, say, for example, the National Library is obviously a key partner and you're featuring a lot of their materials, you know, um, mm -hmm. particularly, say, in the, that, the Free State period exhibition, you know, obviously has a lot of material and it's really important and, and really interesting from their collections. Um, in terms of your relationship with UCD Library and special collections there, because I'm obviously interested in that because there's this particular poetry mm -hmm. focus and that I've been working with myself, and I was wondering, I know on the digital side, you know, you've uh, included the Irish Poetry Reading Archive and the Scholar Casts as, as part of Radio Molly and so on. Um, but I wonder in terms of your engagement with students and kind of the more the education side, perhaps there, are there any sort of current projects or, or recent projects that, that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, there's... Um... It's interesting. There's so much uh, that's in what, what I call the umbilical stage uh, at the moment. Um, and actually, it's, you know, it's one of the really interesting things about the structure uh, of, of Molly. And I think um, I, I might be wrong on, on this, but I think we may share a similar structure with only one other museum uh, and gallery on, on, on the island, the Glucksman down in, uh, down in UCC. Um, but it's really interesting because it, it's giving us as a museum access in um, to these collections, so to the National Library's collections, to, um, to UCD special collections, and in turn, uh, I suppose, turning us into an additional outpost for those collections. Um, and then the, the, the relationship with UCD begins to go deeper because we have, you know, we have postdoc students coming to us um, that we're working on online exhibitions with, um, some of them working on physical exhibitions with them, people coming through with, um, through the Irish Research Council. Um, and they're coming to us with amazing ideas. And then our, you know, our job then becomes, you know, well, how can, how can we resource this and turn those things into something that we can really engage the public with? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's it, again, actually to use the word, it feels really luxurious to, to have a project where those relationships aren't only there, but want to be amplified all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think from, from my own perspective in say working with UCD exhibitions, that idea that students can start thinking about other ways of presenting their work, perhaps other than the conventional academic ways, I think is it's really liberating for them. And it's really creative very often, you know, the kinds of things they're wanting to do. I think it's really broadening the scope for us as teachers, you know, of what, what we might be thinking of. It's kind of challenging us to, to move on in some ways as mm -hmm. well. Um, yeah. I want to talk now a bit about the Nulo Fuelon um, yeah. 
exhibition um, because it's really marvellous and I was very interested in the uh, interview that June Caldwell did um, as part of the UCT festival at home um, that I think is available on YouTube um, yeah. about her, her involvement in that and how the ideas evolved you know it's very very interesting but I was wondering I mean obviously again it's a um, it's a exhibition about a, a woman writer and again a woman who's maybe seen more across the board as a journalist or, you know, a, perhaps a public figure almost more than a, a, a writer in the fullest sense. Um, and obviously this exhibition is doing a lot to make us rethink that book, that, you know, such an important book. Um, and I was wondering, could you talk first of all about the project, you know, its gestation, if you like, and then in particular about how, about how COVID kind of intervened in that in that mm. book? Yeah, um, I had, um, I mean, I'd always been really, I'd always been really fascinated by, uh, by that memoir. I read it, um, I think, shortly after it came out when I was a student uh, of literature myself. Um, I was probably too young to fully appreciate, uh, you know, the importance of it at the time. Um, but then, you know, I, I remember actually sitting uh, in work when, the, uh, when that interview between Nuala and Marion uh, Finucane uh, was broadcast. Um, and that was, a, I just remember at the time, that was a really interesting moment. It felt like something, it felt like somebody was saying something that had not necessarily been said before. Um, and I think a lot of people will remember that interview and just, um, you know, it was a seminal broadcasting moment. Um, actually, even, even you know, when, when, when Marion um, passed away recently, it was, you know, the interview came out again, actually. It was one of those moments in her career that people talked about. Um, so I always felt that, that you know, that memoir, there was something about that memoir that was important, that it had had this social effect. Um, and it was really reading, uh, reading Emily Pine's um, uh, book uh, from a couple of years back, Notes to Self, and looking at the way, uh, the way it spread like, like a secret, the way people were buying multiple copies of Notes to Self to give to people, to kind of say like, you know, there are things in this that you need to know about. Um, and I thought, you know, that's exactly what was happening with Are You Somebody? It was this kind of like truth telling um, piece of writing. And we had talked uh, in here um, with the curatorial team, with Margaret uh, and with Catherine um, in the past about that idea of looking at writers that, that spoke to society um, and going outside of fiction, but like, you know, looking at nonfiction and looking at, you know, um, political writing and writing about ideas. Um, so, uh, and, you know, there was this very young audience for Emily's work and then the, the, the work that was coming, at, you know, in the wake of and at the same time as Emily's work. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a very young audience. Um, have, they, have they come across Are You Somebody? And Emily wrote a, a fantastic article um, relating to Nula for Vanity Fair. And it was like, you know, these things happen in cycles. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, they will probably continue to happen in cycles because they're, they still seem to be very necessary. Um, so I just thought, you know, the time is right to look at, uh, to look at Are You Somebody? And we have, uh, I suppose, a curatorial um, preference in the, in, here in the museum for engaging living artists as guest curators on exhibitions. Um, I had read uh, an article that uh, Martin Doyle and the Irish Times commissioned of, of June um, about Nuala. Uh, I was a big fan of June's writing anyway. I didn't realise that she had, uh, had been so close to Nuala and that she wrote this a new introduction for uh, for an anniversary edition of the memoir. Um, so I just thought that's uh, that's that's exactly who we need to get. I mean, you know, what will June Caldwell cook up for an exhibition on Are You Somebody? Um, and uh, you know, I had to do I had to do a bit of convincing. I think she was a bit a bit a bit shocked to be asked. Um, but June's own background is in journalism, so you know the whole direction that that exhibition took in terms of it being about testimony. Um, the form ended up becoming a, a video installation, which was unexpected as well. Um, and then we ended up, I think, with something that's really quite, quite a powerful um, piece of work now in, 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 in the museum. I mean, we had, you mentioned COVID earlier on and how it altered the, the, the structure. Originally, it was a more interactive exhibition piece that used a lot of headphones. And of course, the pandemic uh, uh, destroyed the business for headphones. Uh, temporarily, so we couldn't we couldn't we couldn't have headphones in the exhibition, um, but we turned it into a. It ended up being a two hour long um, video mm -hmm. installation, and you know people are sitting there for two hours watching it, which is both an incredible thing to see, um, and then also a technical issue for us in the museum because you know we have to move them on through our new one way system. 
um, uh, but um, but I think it's testament to actually, I mean, and, and, and there are, you know, there's a cross-generational appeal to this exhibition. There are particularly mothers coming in with daughters, grandmothers coming in with granddaughters to watch it and sitting there and really absorbing it all. So, um, yeah, I'm very, uh, I'm allowing myself now to be proud of it. You know, I was just <laughs> scared in the first week. You never know how people are going to react. Because it is, it's really a mesmerizing exhibition because I, you know, I spent whatever, about 50 minutes there, you know, illegally, obviously, I know. Um, but that sense that it just, you know, it just hooks you in and, you know, you just, you know, it's, it's very mesmerizing, I think, even though on the face of it, it's quite simple. You know, it's, it's basically yeah. just, it's an interweaving of the text, readings of, the te of parts of the text, and then people's response to the issues, you know, but I think it's the variety of people that were chosen, that vision, I think, behind that, that was really mm. important, you know, from family yeah. members, friends, you know, then, you know, critics or other writers and so on, you know, it's really amazing. I think mm. it'd be a wonderful resource in the future as well, I think. Yeah. Um, there are a um, couple June's Sorry, Simon, go on. Sorry, yeah, I mean, June's, just to, just to mention that, I mean, June, uh, you know, a lot had been, had been made uh, on Nula in the past. There'd been a really significant RT documentary. Um, there had been a lot of conversation about the book, you know, uh, around the time when it, when it came out. But I think one of the things that June really wanted to do was bring in family members, bring in unexpected voices, bring in living writers who'd only recently read that memoir, um, bring in, you know, historians. Dermot Farrater is in there, Emily Pine herself is in there. Um, other writers like Anne Enright. Um, so to have this completely different new take on, on, on that piece of work was, was, was important. And the family as well. Um, you know, when you're dealing with recent history like that, I mean, this is, you know, it's explosive stuff. Mm -hmm. And the family were just to be commended in, in, in how open they were for, for, for letting us go in and do it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's very, you know, to have that that trust, I think, is really important. That really comes comes through in the in the discussions. There's a very interesting question that's come in, so I think I'll move on to looking at a few yeah. of the questions now, and then we can just finish up after that. And mm. um, there's a question from Geraldine Halpin, um, and this is: as a visitor to Mali since it opened, I'm aware of its appeal to educated middle class people. I'm wondering if there are plans to broaden its appeal to include working class people and people in the general area of Stevens Green whose experience uh, who experience social disadvantage. If so, how? And are there any plans for doing outreach work with these communities to encourage them to visit and become members? Yeah, um, Geraldine, that's a great question. So I know we were talking about the learning programme earlier on, and I suppose in this, in this first year, I pr our, our priority has been um, very much around um, working with um, younger audiences, particularly um, audiences who are, who are in deaf schools or, or who are in areas of disadvantage. Um, we actually worked primarily with schools within the local area to develop those learning programs before we opened. Um, and then I suppose our route in to the most disadvantaged young audiences um, are through partnerships with youth and community groups. So I mentioned earlier on the YMCA and Angel Street and um, Solace up in Dublin 8. Um, and that's getting, I mean, that's getting us into, uh, that's getting us into audiences that are, I mean, audiences that are, you know, living in living in hotels, living in direct provision, and um, kids who are just not going to be brought to a place uh, like this. And I mean, I mentioned having a coffee uh, yesterday with Lucy. I, you know, I mentioned something um, that uh, might sound really odd, but very early on, I felt that the biggest challenge, the two biggest challenges that this project would have, would be the subject matter and the buildings. Um, and they're both they're both kind of the greatest assets as well. But, um, you know, for a lot of audiences, and you're right to point it out, um, those, you know, buildings like this are very austere um, and this subject is kind of off limits. Um, so I think that's, that, that will be, that is the most challenging and in turn, I think the most important work that we'll do because there are lots of audiences that are eventually going to come in here. There are lots of kids, lots of adults who will slowly find their way in um, to what we're doing. Um, but it's important that we're, we're actively going out to get, to get everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And I think and you do have to, it does have to be, I think, an active kind of visionary dimension of the programme. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I, I remember in the, in the Nulo Fuelon exhibition, there's uh, a piece uh, where Mary O'Donnell talks about the kind of relationship between universities and this process of excluding writers or, you know, ex you know setting up in some ways those barriers. And I know, you know, in terms of the kind of teaching we're doing in UCD, that there's a real drive to 
go beyond that and you know especially with the rise of interest in working class literature and um, mm -hmm. and literary communities and so on so I think there's, there could be really interesting connections there between new research that's going on and kind of reclamation yeah. projects as well that could mm -hmm. build a kind of natural connection to the community just outside the door as it were you know yeah and and actually, I mean, something that Geraldine touched on in her question as well is 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 how that affects the curatorial side. So, um, you know, I mentioned we're we're following up the Nula of Whalon exhibition uh, with an exhibition for little children, um, and it's an exhibition on Chris Houghton, who's, um, you know, one of our best children's book writers and illustrators, um, and we're designing that exhibition specifically for um for very very young kids to be brought in, um. And there's a two, there's a double edged sword to that where, um, or a two pronged attack where that will also get their parents into this museum. Um, we have, a, you know, we have a, a, a film commission uh, ongoing at the moment that we hope will be installed um, in springtime next year with the filmmaker Seamus Murphy. Um, and it's a partnership with Dublin Port and Screen Ireland. But that's a, a, a film on, on the, poet, the street poet Pat Inglesby. Um, and again, you know, I think that that will that will inevitably ruffle feathers. Probably people will think, well, you know, is Pat is Pat is that high art enough for a museum of literature? But I mean, absolutely. Uh, and I think that ex I think that film is going to be an enormous success, um, because I know that Pat is a poet who, um, although he doesn't feel like he's part of the poetic establishment, I shouldn't speak from, um, but I know he, he wouldn't feel like he's part of that establishment. Um, but he has a huge place in the heart, um, certainly of the people of the city. So I think. Uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. That's exactly the type of thing we should be doing. And having that in a room next to copy number one of Ulysses. I think that's that is it, precisely what we should be doing. Yeah, yeah, breaking those boundaries down. Mm -hmm. And there's another question here actually relating to the Kate O'Brien exhibition. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Monica Wallace and she says, I love Molly and each time I go there, I find something new to think about. It's wonderful, inspiring space. I was disappointed, however, with the temporary exhibition on Kate O'Brien and how light on content it seemed. Was this an example of taking out the reverence? And if, ye if yes, do you think it worked? Um, that's uh, yeah, that's a really that's 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 a really interesting question. I suppose um, one of the things that uh, I mentioned that we do is we engage um, living artists with uh, as as guest curators and exhibitions. And the reason for that is we want to we want those those temporary exhibitions, particularly in that room, to be unexpected um, and to feel different and to not necessarily be just straight biographical. Um, presentations about an author's life because in a way our job is I think to contextualize the art form that we that we're representing um, you know unlike the National Gallery of Ireland um, for example you can experience the art form that we have at home uh, in your living room on your Kindle you know within 10 seconds of buying it and um, so our job as a museum is really to kind of frame the artwork and say, go, you know, go home and engage with it and um, re-engage with this writer, buy their books, read their books. Um, and, and our hope is, is that by bringing in living artists, that they'll do that in different ways that are unexpected and won't be just, you know, typical museum exhibitions as one might expect those to be. Um, so in that one, uh, we had brought in Cathy Rose O'Brien, who is uh, Kate's grandniece. Um, so Kathy and Kathy Rose is a well-known stage actress, um, uh, obviously kind of steeped in theatre. And the way she de she decked out the room as really a series of small little set pieces. It was like a theatre set for Kate's life, um, with you know an introduction really to her life there, but then lots of copies of the books that you could pick up and read. Um, so where it didn't have lots of display cases with things, it was more just an exhibition that we hope people would sit around and pick up things and maybe rummage around and sit down and read things and listen to things and and and, uh, and, and move on from there. Yeah, I was wondering, because, you know, something the same issue struck me, I remember um, when I saw it first, and then I went to that the event with um, Geraldine Meany and um, Kathy Rose, mm. and, you know, because it had that sort of performative element and, uh, mm. you know, also a slightly academic element too, and kind of 
I suppose, highlighted Kate O'Brien's connection to UCD and so on. Um, but it kind of struck me then that the, the exhibition also sort of in some ways made more sense, you know, after having had that experience mm. going to that event, which was really great. Um, and I was wondering if you thought, you know, I mean, obviously you have thought about that relationship between the event, whether it's a lecture, talk, performance, and the physical exhibition, which may not be, as you say, so traditional, so based on cases and objects. Um, and also, if you might think in the future about that sense of having a kind of companion, a digital companion to the physical exhibition, so mm. you can access both in a way. Or yeah, or yeah. So, um, so I mean, on the digital side of the of of our activity, um, every temporary exhibition that we produce will find uh, its way into some kind of digital format eventually. So we're working actually on the digital version of the Kate O'Brien exhibition, which you know. Uh, the internet is kind of a potentially infinite space, so we can we can do a lot more. It will actually have a huge, uh, a much larger amount of information in it. There was an awful lot of, um, you know, readings, recordings, uh, pieces that we made for that that just within the final edit, I suppose, of that exhibition didn't make it in. Um, so that will be the joy of moving these things online eventually as well, is that we can uh, we can then you know we can go as deep as we want into the subject. We can add to the exhibitions online over time. Yeah, and obviously they have been this much longer life, you know, um, yeah. as, as artifacts, if you like, which is great from the educational point of view as well, you know, is that we can actually use those into the future. And um, there's another question from Anne Ellis, which is, how was the name Molly arrived at? It's an inspired name. Um, so we, uh, we, we engaged a, uh, a fantastic agency named CI Studio to help us with the branding. And... Um, the uh, uh previously it had had a working title of uh the ulysses center and um i suppose we i mean we gave them what i felt at the time was it was an impossible brief really we, we said you know we want we want a name that will reflect the gravitas of of the partner institutions um that will describe not only what's happening within the space but also the potential of the space um and then that will uh that will be both kind of serious and playful at the same time and that will contain some kind of uh, Joyce reference that people will feel really happy to have kind of picked up on. And, um, and, it, and it was like, away you go, you know, go figure that one out. Um, and, uh, and they were pretty excited when they, when, when they landed on it. And, uh, and, and we were as well. Funnily enough, everybody else thought it was uh, fantastic. And I was kind of like slightly hesitant at first. I was like, really, really, really? Um, but it, it had that, I mean, it had, it, it, it met that, uh, that requirement of being both serious and being playful. And I think that was really important. I mean, that was a big part of it was, you know, we want people to take ownership of the place and we want it to have a name that people can take ownership of. Um, and that kind of, so the name personalized the museum as a, as a piece of branding, I thought it was really exceptional. And in fact, there's another kind of related question there from Roan Kenny, which is, is there any, any connection with Molly Malone? <laughs> can you kind of... <laughs> Do you <laughs> I'm I'm afraid not, Ron. No, it's Molly <laughs> Bloom, definitely. <laughs> It was actually, actually, that's making me think of an another question, um, which is about, I mean, obviously your, your pedigree is linked to the, the Little Museum of Dublin, and this is a very Dublin-focused, you know, um, Joyce has a very Dublin-focused writer, and I'm wondering, you know, mm. how do you think about the kind of wider, the wider Ireland beyond Dublin, um, and have you got sort of plans around integrating that into your program? Yeah, I mean, it's that uh, um, we're working on a number of projects uh, at the moment that um, hopefully as they come to fruition, uh, we are, are, are looking at cross-border writing, which I think is really, really important. So we're seeing um, our work as, as, as all-island work. Um, there's also the potential of a lot of these temporary exhibitions to travel. Um, and I mean, anybody who works in museums will tell you that, you know, uh, when an exhibition comes down, I mean, what you're left with is really more often than not, you're left with design assets and intellectual assets. Um, and it's not, it's often not too difficult to recreate them for elsewhere. Um, so I'm really keen that these exhibitions travel. We're, 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 we're hoping that the Kate O'Brien exhibition will in some form eventually find a home in Limerick temporarily, um, which I think would make a lot of sense. And also to get outside of Ireland as well and for, for, for some of these exhibitions to travel to, to Europe and to the US is, is important. Yeah, I was interested as well in the Eva Gore Booth one, the, the artworks that were part of that were very much responded mm. to the West of Ireland. Yeah. 
well. So sometimes even if there isn't a very overt, you know, uh, link to another mm. part of, of Ireland, you can sort of bring it in in, um, yeah. in other ways, I suppose. Um, I know I know we're getting fairly close to time now. Mm. So I thought we might finish up by just, um, you know, trying to kind of move away from COVID for a lot of this discussion. But I know from our chat yesterday that you were talking about the ways in which COVID for sort of for both good and ill, if you like, had been you know both challenging, but also in some ways giving you some advantages or, or, or allowed you to move forward with some elements of your programming sooner than you had planned. So mm. I was wondering like you, if we might finish with that sort of question around um, how's it going now uh, under, under not quite mm. lockdown, but now we've emerged from lockdown and mm -hmm. how, what are your plans like, say, for the next six months? Um, well, I suppose the, fir the first part of the question, we, um, uh, one of the really interesting things about the lockdown was that it enabled us to accelerate um, a lot of our online learning um, projects um, and our digital uh, platform, uh, our on-demand streaming platform, Radio Molly, the kind of second phase of that, um, which in hindsight, looking at the amount of work that was involved, it probably would have taken us another two years to do. Um, the online learning components that we had in development were primarily being thought of as aids for schools. Um, and, and teaching resources for primary and secondary schools um, and they were involving a lot of living writers as well so um, we, got to, we got to push ahead with those um, probably a year faster than we would have um, and now we have those there and they were picked up really, uh, really enthusiastically during the lockdown as well a lot of them ended up on school home, the ubiquitous school homework lists that were being emailed out to parents all the time um, so that was, I mean, that was a real silver lining you know, to be able to just pause and look at that work and realize how important it was and we've always been talking um uh, i suppose publicly about the importance of uh, what we call the digital visitor and digital engagement being real engagement with the subject um so i think that whole period has helped a lot of people to understand just how important uh, digital cultural activity is and and um and how it you know it also increases access as well i mean there's been literary festivals happened early on in the lockdown that had audiences that they would never have had before um you know you don't have the chats in the bar afterwards but you are getting out to a lot more people so um so i think that was really interesting um, and then we reopened the museum on july the 20th and uh, we had partially reopened the the cafe shop and gardens uh, at the end of june but we fully reopened on on july the 20th and We've been having a really lovely uh, few weeks since we opened. I mean, it's just been a pleasure. It's a combination of uh, reasonably good weather, um, people feeling like uh, that they wanted to go out again. The fact that the architecture here and the open spaces in the gardens really plays in our favour. Um, it, 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 it is a very safe space. Um, and it's very easy for us to manage the safety, actually, um, of the space as well. It hasn't been uh, onerous at all to really set up those systems within, within this site. Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's it's been going really well. Um, uh, touch wood, it'll 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 continue in that way. Um, I mean, there are challenges ahead in terms of um, I suppose international tourism uh, uh, certainly feels like it's on pause, and I suspect will remain on pause for quite some time. Um, we're into uh, what I described to one of our staff members recently as the the the, the very long overwritten second last chapter of this dystopian novel um, and, uh, and I think it's going to go on for some time unfortunately but um, but I think you know the model that we have here has always been focused on domestic uh, audiences um, and we've had to do a bit of financial remodeling and rethinking about how that works um, but I'm confident that uh, that um, that the museum will will do well even within within this environment because it's something that's that's useful for people here um, and and it's something that serves a purpose for people here. I just noticed actually a couple of questions come in on the other on the other channel. One of them, so, I, so I'd like to take them. One of them mm. uh, relates to young Irish writers. Um, and this is mm. from Neve uh, Linden, and she says, "Will more modern young Irish writers be featured in upcoming exhibitions?" Um, so you know, and I know obviously you do have a commitment to those, obviously bringing um, both young sort of readers and writers through. Mm. So, are there? Do you have any particular plans in that area? Um, uh, beyond the, I suppose the young, the younger writers that are featured in, um, that are featured in exhibitions at at present. So, um, I mean, throughout the exhibitions dotted around, you'll find um, younger writers, particularly actually on our top floor. Um, uh, there's a few, you know, where our, our authors uh, author interviews are. Um, 
I think what's I suppose the 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 main way that we that we engage with younger writers at the moment is through the through the curatorial side. So engaging them actually in projects where they're working with us, and um, not necessarily looking at their own work. Um, uh, some of them were involved, as I mentioned earlier on, in our learning program. So our learning program, uh, the a lot of the online teaching for for slightly older kids, teenagers, and um, we have Dave Rudden and Deirdre Sullivan and Darren Shan and people Anna Carey, people like that working with us, and um, and then through programming in the space as well. Um, you know, we've a, we we have still have a program uh, that when we're able to bring people back on site. Um, strangers together in a room for events and um, we have a program that actually probably um, uh, favours younger writers more than anybody else. That's great and of course that's a kind of an endlessly renewing process I think as well. Of course, yeah. and it's great to see from an educational point of view. There's, there's one other point actually by um, Noreen Whelan about uh, interaction with alumni in fact and people who would have had connections to the building or, or, or sort of I suppose close connections to UCD and you mm. know perhaps involving them more which I think is really interesting to, to have that you know the, both yeah. the current students our future students and mm. our past students as well I think brought together mm. would be fabulous we can find ways to do that yeah so, absolutely um it's time to wrap up i think i'm it's over it's past five two and uh mm -hmm. thanks very much for simon it's been to simon it's been such a pleasure um, thanks, to Lucy. thank you and hope to collaborate sometime in the future absolutely thanks everybody Thanks so much to both of you. That was such a great conversation. Um, really enjoyed it hearing, especially about how accessibility is built in, you know, from the ground up and everything that you do. Um, it's a really cool behind the scenes look at what you have on it, Molly. Um, so thank you both so much, you know, for sharing your time with us. And a special thanks to everyone who's joined us as well um, for your questions, for tuning in. Um, I just have a couple of final notes before we wrap up. So Firstly, um, as many of you know, UCD is committed to supporting our students through this difficult time and giving all in incoming students, regardless of their background, access to the wealth of information available through our partners, such as Molly. Um, to date, over 300,000 euro has been raised by generous alumni and friends of UCD. Um, so thank you to those of you who've already supported this important cause. Um, if you'd like to support our efforts to provide urgent financial and mental health support to those students who need it most, you can visit the link which has been posted in the chat box um, in your own time. Um, also, Molly itself is a hugely ambitious project with the potential to create a legacy for Irish writing that will outlive us all. Um, the progress made to date could not have been achieved without the extraordinary generosity of Molly's donors and supporters. So for further information on how you can support Molly, please contact UCD Foundation at the email address, which is also posted in the chat here. Um, and if you like today's discussion, we have a special event coming up on Thursday, August 27th. It's coordinated by UCD Foundation, um, and it features UCD alumni Isabel Garvey, Managing Director at Abbey Road Studios, in conversation with Dave Fanning, who is the um, Irish television and radio broadcaster, rock journalist, DJ, film critic, and author. You can sign up through the link in the chat for that as well. Um, and finally, we'd be delighted to hear your suggestions for future conversation topics for the series. Um, simply email alumni at ucd.ie to let us know what you have in mind. Um, and just to wrap up, thanks so much for being with us this evening. We look forward to welcoming you to our next session. And in the meantime, please stay safe.